In this demonstration, I'm going to show you the process of developing a classification tree in R to predict whether a Sunnyview Bank customer is likely to respond to a home equity line of credit offer. The most popular algorithm for building decision trees in R can be found in the R part package. As we discussed in the lecture, training a classification tree involves growing the tree and then pruning the tree to optimize model complexity. Traditionally, the training data is used to grow the tree and the validation data is used to prune the tree. And finally, a test data set is used to evaluate the performance of the tree on an unseen data set. However, the R part package in R implements a k-fold cross-validation process for pruning decision trees. Therefore, there is no need for a separate data partition for training and pruning the tree. So in this example, we will use the two-way partitioning method that only partitions the data into training and validation data sets. We will use the training data for both growing the tree and pruning the tree and then use the validation data set for evaluating model performance. So first, let's import the data from the HELOC underscore data worksheet into a data frame or table and label it my data in RStudio. As you can see, the data has four variables, age, sex, income, and whether the customer accepted an HELOC offer or not. And the first three variables are the independent variable, whereas the last variable is the target variable. Let's start a new R script. For this demonstration, we need to use the caret gains r part r part dot plot and the p r o c packages. Install these packages using the install dot packages function if you don't have these packages installed. And after installing the packages, you can launch them using the library function. Let's run these lines to launch the packages.
if you're using an R version other than the version 3.5.3 .3 that I'm using, uh, you may want to run this line of code so that you have the same random number generator settings as mine. By running this line of code, you will get the same result as I do, no matter which version of R you are using. Now let's run this line. For constructing a classification tree model, R requires that the target variable HELOC be a factor variable, which is a categorical data type. We can use the as.factor command to convert the HELOC variable into a categorical type. Enter and run the following command. By running this command, we have converted the HELOC variable into a factor variable in R. We will now first randomly partition the data into training and validation datasets. In order to get the same data partitions as I do, we are going to use the set.seed command to set the random seed to 1. We then use the create data partition function to partition the data into 70% training and 30% validation. You can also partition the data using a 60-40 partition, but in this example, we decide to use the 70-30 partition because first, decision trees is a data-driven technique, so a larger training data set will likely generate more accurate models. And the two, we will use the training data for both growing and pruning the tree, so it is beneficial to have a larger training data set. Now enter the following comments to partition the data. Now run these four lines of code to partition the data. A note here, if you are using a version of the correct package that is different from what I'm using, you may receive an error message from the previous statement. And a quick fix for this error is that instead of using this line of code, you can type in train set my data bracket the combine function c my 
index comma. By running this line, you will not get the error message. However, the resulting data partitions should remain the same as what I have here. We now are going to use the rpart function to generate the default classification tree, default underscore tree. Because R uses the cross-validation method for pruning the tree, to ensure consistency of the cross-validation results, we are going to use the set.seed function again to set a random seed of 1. Within the R part function, we specify the model structure, data source, and the method. As you can see, we set the HELOC variable as the target variable, and the rest of the variables as the predictor variables by using the tilde dot size. The method option is set to class for developing a classification tree. Let's first run these two lines to get the default tree. And to view the details about the default tree, use the summary function. If you take a look at the R result, the summary provides you with some details of the model, but it is more interesting to have a visual view of the classification tree. To view the classification tree visually, use the PRP function. In the PRP function, the type option is set to equal to 1, so that all nodes except the leaf nodes are labeled in the tree diagram. The extra option is set to equal to 1, so that the number of observations that fall into each node are displayed. The end option is set to true to put the number of cases under each decision node in the diagram. Now let's run this line. Let's take a look at the default tree. As you can see, the first decision node of the default classification tree produced by the R part function is on the sex variable, followed by age and income splits. Note that R presents decision trees in a slightly different format as we discussed in the lecture. The root node provides information about how to interpret the tree. For example, in the root node, it shows that if the answer to the condition sex is female is yes, then go to the left branch. 
Otherwise, go to the right branch. The subsequent decision nodes follow the same format. For example, the second decision node here suggests that if the answer to the condition age is less than 25 is yes, then go to the left branch, otherwise go to the right branch. How does R determine the number of splits in the default classification tree? The R part function uses the complexity parameter or CP values to determine when to stop growing the tree. If the cost of adding another split to the tree exceeds the value of CP, then the tree growth will not continue. The default CP value for the R part function is 0 0.01. However, in most cases, it is very difficult to know which CP value will produce the best performing tree beforehand. Therefore, a common practice is to grow the full tree and then prune it to a less complex tree based on the classification errors produced by a built-in cross-validation process of the R part function. By identifying the value of CP associated with the smallest cross-validated classification error, we can create the minimum error tree. Alternatively, we can produce the best pruned tree, which is the smallest tree with an error rate that is within one standard error of the minimum error rate. Next, I'll demonstrate the pruning process to optimize the complexity of our tree. We are going to first grow the full tree by using the R part function. Again, to ensure consistency of the cross-validation results, we are going to specify a random seed of 1 using the setSeed function. As you can see from this command, this time we set the option CP to 0, minimum split equal to 2, and the minimum bucket equal to 1. The minimum split option specifies the minimum number of observations in the parent node that can be split further, and the minimum bucket option specifies the minimum number of observations that are allowed in the leaf node. These settings would ensure that the largest possible tree will be produced by this command. Now let's run these two lines. Again, it is interesting to look at the full tree graphically. So let's use the PRP function to plot the full tree. Let's run this line. Now, as you can see, the full tree in this case is very complex and difficult to read, but that is okay. We do not need to read the full tree. As we discussed before, the full tree produces zero classification error on the training data. 
so it usually overfits and won't be very useful in making predictions. What we need is to identify the optimal size of the tree by inspecting the cross-validated classification errors. To identify the value of the complexity parameter, or CP, that is associated with the smallest cross-validated classification error, we are going to use the printCP function to display the complexity parameter table. Let's run this line. As you can see, now R displays the complexity parameter table. Now let's take a look at the complexity parameter table for the nine candidate trees with increasing complexity. The end split column shows the number of splits for each tree. The number of leaf nodes for each tree can be calculated using n split plus 1. For example, the last tree has 82 splits, so it would have 82 plus 1 or 83 leaf nodes. And that happens to be the tree that you are seeing as the full tree here. The relative error column shows the fraction of misclassified cases for each tree relative to the fraction of misclassified cases in the root node. If all cases are classified into the predominant class. So as you can see here, the last tree has a relative error of zero because it is the fully grown tree whose leaf nodes only contain cases that belong to the same class. Therefore, there is no misclassified cases. The X error column shows the cross-validation errors associated with each candidate tree. It is the recommended measure for identifying the tree that can potentially perform well on new datasets. As you can see from the X error column, the cross-validation errors decrease initially as the classification tree becomes more complex and then increase after a certain point. And this is common and indicative of the overfitting problems with complex tree models. The fourth tree with six splits has the lowest cross validation error, 0 0.83516, relative to the cross validation error of the root node. Therefore, it is identified as the minimum error tree. The last column, the X standard column, contains the standard error, and it can be used to identify the best pruned tree, which is the smallest tree with an error that is within one standard error of the minimum error tree. In this case, no simple tree has a cross-validation error that meets this criterion. In other words, no simpler tree has a relative cross-validation error that is less than 0 0.83516 plus 0 0.084763 or 0 0.919923. Therefore, the best prune tree and the minimum error tree are the same tree in this case. However, in many cases, you may find that the best pruned and the minimum error trees are two different trees. To obtain the minimum error and the best pruned tree, we use the prune function to create the pruned tree by using the CP value that is associated with the fourth tree. Please note that the CP values provided in R results are rounded to seven digits after the decimal points. 
So to ensure that we do not use a CP value that is less than the actual CP value, we would use a CP value that is slightly larger than the CP value displayed in the table, but lower than the CP value for the next smaller tree. In this case, the displayed CP value associated with the fourth tree is 0 0.0164835. So we will use 0 0.0164836, which is a number that is slightly larger than the CP value displayed, but still smaller than the CP value associated with the next smaller tree. And we are going to call the new tree prune the tree. Let's enter this line of code. Now let's run this line of code to produce the prune the tree, and then we're going to display the prune tree using the PRP function. Now let's run this line of code, and let's take a look at the prune tree. As expected, it has 6 splits and 7 leaf nodes, as described before. Note that this is a much simpler tree with fewer branches compared to the default tree. How does this classification tree perform on unseen datasets? Well, we will evaluate the performance of the pruned tree using the validation data set. We'll first predict the class memberships of the observations in the validation data set using the predict function. In this line of code, we are using the pruned tree to predict cases in the validation data set. And we set the type option equal to class so that the class membership is produced instead of probabilities. Let's run this line of code. Now with the predicted class membership, we are able to create a confusion matrix by comparing the predicted class memberships and the actual class memberships of the validation data set. We are going to use the confusion matrix function to produce the confusion matrix and the various performance measures. The positive equal to 1 option specifies 1 as the target class, and class 1 refers to the class of customers who responded to a HELOC offer. 
Let's run this line of code. Now let's take a look at the confusion matrix here. The confusion matrix shows that the model has an overall accuracy rate of 76.67%, sensitivity of 0 0.4872 and the specificity of 0 0.8649. These measures suggest that while the overall accuracy rate is relatively high, the model classifies a much larger portion of the non-target class cases than target class cases correctly using the default cutoff rate of 0 0.5. As noted earlier, these performance measures are highly sensitive to the cutoff value. In this example, the default cutoff value of 0 0.5 is much higher than the proportion of target class cases in the dataset, which is about 0 0.26. By lowering the cutoff value to be closer to the actual class distribution, we will be able to classify more cases into the target class and improve the sensitivity measure. To evaluate the predicted performance of the classification tree model using a different cutoff value in R, we first compute the probability of each validation case belonging to the target class instead of its class membership. We can use the predict function to do that, except this time in the predict function we set the type option equal to prob to predict the probability values. Enter this line of code. Let's run it. Now let's take a look at some of the predicted probability values by using the head function here. So if you look at the result here, the first column lists the probabilities of the cases belonging to class 0 while the second column lists the probabilities of the cases belonging to class 1. To determine the class memberships of cases using a cutoff value other than the default value of 0 0.5, for example, let's use 0 0.26 in order to accurately classify more class 1 cases, we're going to compare the values in the second column to the new cutoff value. So to construct a new confusion matrix using the new cutoff value of 0 0.26, we are going to use the if-else function to determine the class memberships. We are also going to use the as.factor function to convert the class membership to factor, which is the same data type as the target variable HELOC. Now enter this line of code. So this part of the code shows that if the predicted probability is greater than 0 0.26, then we are going to assign 1 to this case, otherwise assign 0. And then we compare it to the 
HELOC values in the validation data set. Again, using one as the target class. Now let's run this line and take a look at the new confusion matrix. The resulting confusion matrix provides the performance measures of the pruned decision tree using the cutoff value of 0 0.26. The accuracy, sensitivity, and the specificity are 0 0.7667. 0 0.6410 and 0 0.8108 respectively. The new cutoff value allows the manager of the bank to identify more target class cases correctly as signified by the higher sensitivity value. To evaluate model performance independent of the cutoff value, we now examine the cumulative lift chart, decile-wise lift chart, and the ROC curve. We first convert the target variable HELOC to a numeric data type as required by the gains package using the as.numeric function. We then generated the cumulative lift table using the gains function. The gains function requires two inputs, actual class memberships and the predicted target class probabilities, which are in the second column of the predicted underscore prob data frame we created earlier. So enter these two lines of code. Now run these two lines of code to take a look at the gains table. Let's take a look at the gains table in the result. By default, the gains table should provide 10 groups, but because there are only 6 possible target class probabilities in the pruned tree, which are 0 0.73, 0 0.67, 0 0.27, 0 0.25, 0 0.07, and the zero that can be assigned to each case. The gains function generates only six groups instead of the default 10 groups, one for each unique probability value. And that is why you are getting this error message that says fewer distinct predicted values than groups requested. And you can ignore this warning message in this case. Now let's plot the cumulative lift chart that's our wise lift chart and the ROC curve using the information from the gains table. Since the syntax of these commands has been discussed in detail in previous demonstrations, I won't repeat them here. Let's enter the commands.
This command plots the cumulative lift chart using the data from the gains table. You can see the cumulative lift chart here on the right side of the screen. Now let's add a line to this cumulative lift chart to show the base model. Let's run this line of code. This command draws a diagonal line that represents the base model. As the lift chart shows, the classification tree performs better than the base model, which is the result of random selection. This means that using the classification tree, we will be able to identify a larger portion of the actual customers who respond to the HELOC offer by targeting a smaller portion of the high probability customers. And the same information can also be seen from the gains table. In the gains table, the first 14% of the customers with the highest probability of responding to the HELOC offer has a lift index of 2.01. That means by targeting the top 14% of the customers, with the highest probability of responding to the offer, you will be able to reach out to twice as many customers who actually respond to the offer compared to randomly selecting 14% of the customers to reach out to. Now let's create the decile-wise lift chart using the bar plot function. Now uh, let's run this line. The decile wise lift chart shows the same information as the cumulative lift chart, but in deciles. If you look at the first bar in the bar chart, it shows that by targeting the 14% of the customers with the highest predicted probabilities of responding to the offer, the bank will be able to capture twice as many actual responders as if 14% of the customers were randomly selected. This again shows that the classification tree performs better than a random selection. Now let's create the ROC curve and find out 
the area under the curve value. We are going to plot the RLC curve using the plot.rlc function. And then we are going to show the area under the curve value. Then we are going to show the area under the curve value using the AUC function. Now let's run these three lines of code. On the right side of the screen, we are going to see the RLC curve. Again, the RLC curve shows that the classification tree model outperforms the baseline model in terms of both sensitivity and the specificity across all cutoff values. And on the left side of the screen, you can see that the area under the curve value is 0 0.805, which also reinforces this finding. Finally, we are going to score the 20 new cases to predict how likely these customers will respond to the HELOC offer. We first import the data from the HELOC underscore score worksheet into a data frame called MyScoreData and then use the predict function to produce the predicted class memberships and the probabilities for the new cases using our classification tree. As you can see, the score data only has three independent variables, and the target variable will be predicted by our model. Let's go back to our R script and enter the following lines of code. Uh, let's run these four lines of code and take a look at the result. The scoring result here shows both the predicted class membership and the, the predicted uh, probability. The first customer has a 0 0.9274611 probability of not responding. Therefore, she is assigned to class zero. The last customer has a probability of 0 0.7333333 of responding or belonging to the target class. Hence, he is assigned to class one. 
This demonstration shows you how to create a classification tree in R. As you can see, the process involves data partitioning, growing the classification tree to the maximal tree or full tree, pruning the classification tree to find the optimal tree structure for prediction, evaluating tree performance on unseen data sets, and then finally scoring the new data.